Good morning. How are you? How are you? Great. Good. Good. Good to hear. Good to see you. Let's worship our Lord together. Let's open in our hymnal number 363, 363, More Love to Thee. And as you're going there, I just want to read real quickly part of uh, Psalm 100, verses 3 to 5. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So many reasons to praise him. So let's stand and just do that. together to worship him to start the week off in the name of Christ under the banner of his grace under the pleasure of his truth to those of you who are worshiping online we welcome you as well we look forward to having you here with us uh, as soon as it is possible but it is good to be in your home together with you on this Lord's Day morning let's pray together shall we our Lord and our God we are grateful that your love to us is perfect, that no more love can be extended to us for you have perfected your love for us. And for that, we are grateful and we worship you this morning. And we pray, O God, that as a result of joining together in your name under the banner of your precious grace, that we indeed would develop a greater, deeper, more significant love for you. Show us, Lord, your beauty. Teach us of your majesty. Lord, help us to see your glory, that our love for you would abound. In your name we pray. Amen. wow, I mean, for a small group of people, you've really come through and uh, volunteered so much, and I thank you so very much for that. Um, Our Michigan group is having many, many meetings, (laughs) and writing the curriculum, and 
uh, pulling everything together before uh, about 25 of them head out here uh, to join with us in, in having Vacation Bible School. Um, we have decorations that are absolutely gorgeous. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we could use a couple guys after church today to carry some stuff up to this back room here. So if you're available after service, we'd appreciate that. We had people volunteer for snacks. Um, thank you for that. We have people volunteering for many things. We just have a couple of different spots left uh, to be filled. But I gotta ask you a question. And this is a show of hands question, if you're brave. How many of you personally, or your kids, or your grandkids maybe, um, either heard the gospel for the first time, had some seeds planted, or came to Christ, uh, gave your life to Christ as a result of some sort of children's ministry? Maybe it was Sunday school, maybe it was a vacation Bible school. Is there anyone here, I'm going to raise my hand because I'm one of those people, that your first exposure or your, the time you gave your life to Christ was as a result of a children's ministry. Thank you. Um, I'm one of those people. I was seven years old. It was after a Sunday school class. My family was going through an extraordinarily horrible time. I went home. I do not remember the lesson. Sorry, Sunday school teachers. <laughs> I'm also one of them. Um, I don't remember the lesson. But God planted a seed in my heart that day. And as a result, he called me to himself, and I gave my life to Christ. Our, the only need, the biggest need we have left for Vacation Bible School is for children to register. Please, 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 I have hundreds of these invitation cards left. Please personally invite children. Another idea, I recently went to a local store, and I asked them, May I put these on the counter? I knew they would say no. They did say no, but guess what they said? Well, our policy is that you can't do that, but if you want to leave a stack of them, we'll put them in our break room. And so they did that. So employees can see them, and maybe they'll, their children will come. Please take a stack. When you go shopping, ask. I know it takes some guts, but please, we want children to come. Our heart is for the children. Um, there's also a mom's and grandma's Bible study being offered. Um, and of course, we want them to hear the word of God. That's our heart. I know that was a long announcement, but um, I ask you to take some invitations, give them out liberally. We have plenty, and we have two weeks. Um, okay, enough of that. <laughs> you can see me at the table in the back if you have questions about that after. Home Bible study will be this Tuesday at uh, our home, the prayer home. If you need our address, um, you can uh, ask me for it afterwards. So that will be Tuesday, uh, August 3rd, this Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. at our home. You're all welcome. Come and uh, we'll have a great time digging into the word of God and seeing uh, what it has to say and have, uh, Lord willing, another great discussion around the word of God. Um, baptisms will be held at the beginning of September, so save the date September uh, 5th. Um, if you are um, considering uh, the waters of baptism, if God is working in your heart, if you have given your life to Christ but you have not yet gone through the waters of baptism, please speak to Pastor Paul. He would love to talk to you about that. Um, reminder, if you are on a cleaning team, um, please watch your calendar and uh, please uh, try to keep up with that and make sure that the, either the top floor or the bottom floor, whatever you're scheduled for, uh, that is done. Uh, please remember to clean when it's your turn. Thank you. Um, and lastly, we do air our service weekly on Optimum Cable TV on Channel 21, Sundays at 8 p.m. So if you have, if you hear a particular service uh, that you'd like to hear again or recommend to somebody, um, that's another way to watch besides YouTube online, which you can find on a link uh, on our website and our Facebook page. Um, I do believe that um, it is the previous week's sermon or service that you will hear. Yes, that's been confirmed. So in other words, this week's service will be heard next week at 8 p.m. on Optimum Cable TV Channel 21. Thanks. If you would open it to the Old Testament to Psalm 32. Psalm 32 for this morning's reading. This is a Psalm of David. Debbie had mentioned a little bit when she was speaking about how 
often we don't take things to God right away. David speaks of that in this psalm and how God's hand lays heavy on you when that happens. But when you confess your sins and you repent, God is faithful to forgive and restore. Okay. Psalm 32, let's begin. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle or will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Amen. Join me in your Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 20, please. We are looking at the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. You could also read those same commandments expressed in Deuteronomy chapter 5, just before the people of Israel entered the Promised Land. Those commandments were repeated because we do tend to forget them. Exodus chapter 20. Let me remind you of how important the Old Testament is. I know as New Testament Christians, we spend a lot of time in the New Testament. Good. Good for you. But let me remind you how important it is to also spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is more than half of the Bible. 39 of the 66 books are the Old Testament. And keep in mind that you cannot understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. In order for you to understand the New Testament, you must comprehend the Old Testament. You take, for example, the book of Hebrews. You cannot understand the book of Hebrews unless you've been reading Leviticus. Leviticus? When was the last time you read that? Well, if you want to read Hebrews, begin with Leviticus. You'll re remember that when Peter was preaching at the very beginning of the church in the book of Acts. He preached from what? From the Old Testament. From the book of Joel. The Old Testament book of Joel. And thousands of people, 5,000 people, came to a saving knowledge of Christ as a result of preaching from the Old Testament. When Jesus Christ was on the road to Emmaus, after the resurrection... And he encountered two of the disciples, and they didn't know it was him. And they spoke to him, and he explained who he is and what he had done. What did he speak from? He spoke from the Old Testament. You see, the Old Testament reveals to us the Christ. You cannot understand the New Testament unless your nose is in the Old Testament. It's crucial. We believe in the inspired word of God. That means from Genesis all the way over to the book of Revelation, we have the word of God. God has revealed himself in these pages. And so the good student of the word of God will read from both ends of the Bible. So here we are in the book of Acts, uh, rather in the book of Exodus. We've already done Acts. We're in a book of Exodus, looking to better understand who Christ is and what Christ has done for us by studying what Christ has said thousands of years ago, not only to the people of Israel, but to us as well. 
And here we have the Ten Commandments. Do you realize that if we were to keep the Ten Commandments, if society was to keep the Ten Commandments, we could get rid of critical race theory? The Ten Commandments would eliminate racism if we would only keep them. The, the Ten Commandments actually adds burden to us because the Ten Commandments points out our sin. I don't think any of us here can go a single day without breaking at least one of the Ten Commandments. Any one of you? Am I right or wrong? Some of us struggle with all ten on a daily basis. Right? And the truth is, is that if you break one, you're guilty of breaking all ten. That's what Christ said, because they are one legislation. The Ten Commandments point to us, points out to us that we are sinners. However, the Ten Commandments also provides the means by which we can escape the plague of our sin. The Ten Commandments takes us to Christ. And there our sins are removed. There our guilt is done away with. There we are expiated. Our guilt is removed. But first, God shows us our guilt. And then he removes it through Jesus Christ. And that's what Psalm 32 tells us. We read it just a few minutes ago, but let me read a few verses once again to you. Verses 1, 2, and 5 reads this way. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Verse 5. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 32 parallels with Psalm 51. The two should be read together. And so the Ten Commandments do not make us sinners. The Ten Commandments actually points out that we are sinners and that God liberates us from sin. It's a good thing. And last week when we looked at the Ten Commandments, we looked at the first half or the first table, Commandments 1, 2, 3, and 4. And today we're going to look at part of the second table, Commandments 5, 6, and 7. The first table deals with what? How man deals with or interacts with? God. And the second table, how man interacts with man. The priority, of course, is your relationship with God, and it's now should be affecting your relationship with each other. So let's take a look at verses 12, 13, and 14, or commandments 5, 6, and 7. And commandment number 5 at verse 12 is this. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now some years ago, many years ago now, a teenage girl, 15 years old at the time, a girl who was constantly fighting and bickering with her father in particular. And she came up to my wife and said, look at what verse I found in the Bible. And she points out to my wife, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, which reads, fathers do not exasperate your children. And she was pretty proud. She looked at my wife as if to say, now I have divine ammunition by which I could look at my father and say, Christian man, your rules are exasperating me. Cease and desist. But instead, my dear wife looked to her and said, yes, but did you read the verse before that? It reads, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. And this poor girl walked away with her head down and very sad. Well, here we have commandment number five, and it's a commandment that takes you back to the home. Its target is your life at home, the family. 
What happens in the home is going to affect the entirety of your life. And those of you who are older know that to be the case. Whether for good or for poor, how you lived at home has impacted your life today. This commandment, in this commandment, we see the value of godly parents, but we also see the value of godly children. Children who obey their parents, and there is a promise given to them. Now, just last night, I was in a conversation with a couple who lives across the street from uh, a mafia mobster family, uh, one of the New York mafia families. And um, although they live in Jersey, um, and this, fam this family, this man in particular, seems to be made of Teflon, and nothing sticks him. He gets away with everything. The police come and do nothing, no matter what he does. And, and they're kind of scared, obviously, but also very frustrated. And they have a little boy who's not even in junior high yet, who's got the foulest mouth. And, and where did he learn this? He learned it from dad. He speaks just like his dad, except that he doesn't have a cigar. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> no. Parents are responsible for teaching children godly values. You will teach your children values. The question is, will it be godly values? Grandparents as well. Now, I know in the more Americanized society, it's more detached, right? Um, as brand new grandparents, uh, um, we, we are learning what is our relationship to this child and correcting this child in disciplining this child. Uh, and in the more American way, you know, parents are fully responsible and grandparents are not and aunts and uncles are not. But in the Latino world, it's completely different. In the Latino world, mom and dad spank you in the rear and so does grandma and grandpa after that and then come the aunts and the uncles. That's the way it is. Right. Now, is that biblical? Well, that's a whole different question. This is biblical. Parents are responsible for teaching values, godly values, and proper worldview to their children. However, children are responsible for learning those values and worldview. And the sooner you learn, the better off you will be. The sooner you learn, the better off you will be. Let me read to you from Proverbs 3.16, referring to wisdom. It says, long life is in her wisdom. Long life is in wisdom's right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Parents are God's tool for bringing freedom to children. Uh, you'll recall what we saw in the prologue, chapter 20, verse 2, the Ten Commandments. It, it reads, I am the Lord your God and brought you out of bondage. The, and, and then God gives these commandments, these rules. These rules are designed to bring freedom to your life, not bondage. Wise and godly parents are the tools that God uses to set you free. God is indeed concerned for every child. And that's why he gives these Ten Commandments, especially for those who are young. Now, you, you can very easily look at the Ten Commandments and say, well, I understand why murder is wrong. I understand why stealing is wrong. I understand why God here is telling me not to covet and not to lie. But why in the world is, is honoring my father and mother equated in terms of importance with these other elements. Well, the, the reason why God places this commandment smack in the middle of the ten is because your treatment of your parents will, by and large, determine the outcome of your life. It will determine the outcome of your life. Parents do have a responsibility towards their children's well-being, but look, children, you have a responsibility towards your own well-being as well, and you need to take in what your parents are telling you, learn from them, honor your father and mother. Let me try to illustrate it this way. Let me try to illustrate it by using a sailboat. And 
each of the Ten Commandments is a part of the sailboat. And, and let's say that the, um, the commandment, do not lie, are the sails of the boat. Do not steal is the hull of the ship. Do not covet is the wheel of the ship, the steering of the ship. Well, honor your father and mother is that little rudder on the bottom of the boat that nobody sees that's going to determine the direction of your life. How do you honor your parents? Well, you begin by respecting them. And then you imitate them when they do what is right. You honor your parents when you encourage them. Have you considered encouraging your parents? Thanks, that was really good. Wow, I really appreciate the way you did that. That really was done well. Thanks for being available. Oh, thanks for providing. Thanks for dinner. Thanks for ironing. Thanks for making sure I showered. <laughs> encourage your parents. Pray for them. Honor your parents. Pray for them. Obey them. Obey them. And highly consider what they have to say. And you will be honoring your parents. Proverbs 30, 11 reads this way. There is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. We are living in that generation now. But it doesn't have to be your case. It doesn't have to be the case of your children or grandchildren either. Here's commandment number six. It's verse 13, Exodus 20, verse 13, a very short commandment. Number six, you shall not murder. You shall not murder. The New City Catechism, and by the way, catechism is a good thing. We don't use that term very much in our circles, but a catechism is a good way uh, uh, to learn. A catechism is simply a summary of the principles of our faith, of what Christianity believes, and, and learned in, in a fashion of question and answer, question and answer. It's a great way to teach children, but it's also a great way to teach adults what do we believe. And the New City Catechism reads this way. What does the sixth commandment require of us? What does it require of us? And here's the answer. That we do not hurt or hate or be hostile to our neighbor, but be patient and peaceful, pursuing even our enemies with love. Now, this commandment here is hardly controversial. I think you would agree. Do not murder. Do not kill. But, but notice something in particular here. The commandment is not a prohibition against killing. It does not say, do not step on that cave cricket. It is not saying, do not slaughter the cow. It is not saying, do not go to war. It is not saying capital punishment is wrong. It is saying here, do not murder another human life. That's what the commandment is saying. Specifically, it is forbidding the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being to another. Even if that premeditation is just for a few seconds, it forbids intentional, unlawful slaughter of another person. Do not murder. Now, broadly, as the New City Catechism would suggest, the commandment simply prohibits the maltreatment of others in a way that's going to jeopardize their well-being. But specifically, it is saying here, do not murder. As you well know, society is increasingly becoming more and more violent. I remember as a boy watching the old Western movies and thinking, oh, can you imagine living in such a violent society where these gunslingers come in the middle of the town shooting their guns up in the air? Those bullets are going to land somewhere, I would always think. Walking into the saloon, and the next thing you know, there's a shootout, shootout in the middle of the road, and people hanging, uh, hiding rather behind uh, water barrels and the general store. 
And, and I would think, oh, can you imagine living that way? And look at how we're living today. You know, at Times Square, they're not hiding behind water barrels. They're hiding behind yellow cabs. But we've become such a violent society. I, I've often heard it said that, that it is safer to live in Iraq than in Chicago. And I always shook my head, impossible. Can't be. So this week I decided to look it up. Could it be? Well, I looked up the crime rate, the crime index in Baghdad. Baghdad is a major city in Iraq, war-torn Iraq. And the crime index in Baghdad is 64.16. 64.16. That's in this year, 2021, February. The crime index in Chicago as of July, and I'm not counting this past weekend, the crime index in Chicago is 65.10. Meaning that Chicago is 1% more dangerous than Baghdad. Shooting, rioting, pillaging. All of this goes unhampered in our major cities. And we could argue as to why, but the reality is, it's violent. And it's becoming the norm. Our highways are filled with people who have road rage, of all things, willing to kill others to get to work. But I would say that the most dangerous place to live, the most violent place to live in these United States is a mother's womb. And I say that because in 2018, more than 620,000 babies were killed. However, that's 240,000 less than the year before. Violent. Our media is violent, and our media has taught us to be desensitized to violence so that we could watch graphic war movies while eating popcorn. We could watch people being tortured on TV and not even flinch. The American Psychological Association said that by the time the average child finishes elementary school, that child will have watched 8,000 televised murders, and 100,000 acts of on-screen violence. So that murder has become entertaining. It's not that we find murder entertaining per se. It's that we feel that in order for us to be entertained, we have to watch murder. We have to watch uh, in realism. Otherwise, it's not entertaining. It's, it's interesting because we like our entertainment to be real, but we don't like the reality of our own lives. The word here in the Hebrew, verse 13, chapter 20, Exodus, you shall not murder, is one of eight words meaning kill. You shall not kill. The word here is ratzak. And this word is never used when talking about hunting or the military or capital punishment. This Hebrew word is used only in reference to the illegal, premeditated killing of another human being. Thus, it's translated murder. Now, murder obviously is intentionally, unjustly pulling the trigger, yes. But as Trevin Wax points out, murder can also be the result of doing nothing. As in the case of the Good Samaritan. And you had all these even religious people walking right past that man who was broken and dying on the side of the road. And they just walked past because they had other places to be, other things to do. Murder can also be not doing something when you can do something to help. So these men, they did not beat him or, or, or rob him, but they are responsible for his condition because they did nothing when they could do something. It becomes even worse when we can do something and we refuse to do anything 
and instead we videotape it and then post it. That's far worse. And that's where our culture has, has gone to. Well, what makes murder so wrong? Now, that's an odd question, isn't it? Well, you're killing somebody. Well, what, what makes it wrong? Why is murder wrong? I, I could slaughter a pig, but I can't slaughter my neighbor? Why? Well, I'll give you three reasons why murder is wrong. The first one is this. Murder is wrong because God is not only the giver of life, God alone is the taker of life. God is the giver of life, and God is the taker of life. So that unjust killing is murder, including euthanasia. Number two. Murder is wrong because human life is infinitely valuable because the human being is created in the image of God. Dolphins are not. I think it's a shame when these fishing nets capture all these dolphins and kill them. But it's not murder. It's just foolish. But it is murder when you take a human life unjustly because that human life is created in the image of God. And there is our value. Our value is not in our mental capacity. Our, our value is not in our creativity. Our value is in the fact that we are created in the imago Dei, the image of God. And murder is wrong, number three, because it does not mete out due process which is required for justice. Murder is wrong because it does not allow for justice. It's usually due to revenge or fear. And notice something interesting about the person and work, the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus was peaceable even when he was provoked. Peaceable even when provoked, even to the point of death. Here is commandment number seven, verse 14. You, sh you shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. Once again, this commandment takes us back to the home, to the place where we are ourselves, to the place where we are most comfortable, to the place we create for ourselves as a haven for rest and we work so hard for, a place where we spend our daily lives. This commandment here provides the most base and core rule for the home by laying down a foundation for security and for love between a husband and a wife. You cannot, commit, you cannot commit adultery unless you're married. You can commit fornication, but you cannot commit adultery unless you're married. And, and the result of obeying this commandment is not only love, deepening love between a husband and a wife, but it is also security for every child that lives under that roof. Do not commit adultery. It's a commandment for the Christian home, but it's also a commandment for the non-believing home. It brings about an underlying joy in the home when there is this sort of fidelity between a husband and a wife. And it leaves behind a blameless legacy. And just as commandment number five was for children, so commandment number seven is for adults. Do this and your home will prosper. Jesus Christ advocated this commandment twice in the Gospel of Matthew. In chapter 5 and then again in chapter 19, he quotes this commandment, upholding the fact that we need to, we must refrain from adultery. Adultery is a dismantling of marriage. It violates a covenant of loyalty made to each other. I'm going to be performing a wedding later today. 
And, and I'm always nervous when I'm doing weddings. In fact, I love it when my wife is there because she reminds me of all the details I forget. And she's not going to be there. I'm in trouble. It's really the only time I get nervous when I'm doing pastoral things. It's at weddings. But you know who's even more nervous? The bride and the groom. Oh, they were trembling. <laughs> because they realize how solemn this is. It's not that they're afraid to marry each other, but they realize that they are making a covenant, a permanent covenant with each other before God. And they best take it seriously. Adultery soils trust and dirties intimacy. Marriage is in, an institution of God. He created it. it, it the, the importance of family is unparalleled in all of God's creation. Dr. Al Mohler writes this. It's a little long. Listen. The Bible presents a conception of marriage that goes far beyond what most persons have even imagined. According to the Bible, marriage is not primarily about our self-esteem and personal fulfillment, nor is it just one lifestyle option among others. The Bible is clear in presenting a picture of marriage that is rooted in the glory of God made evident in creation itself. The man and the woman are made for each other, and the institution of marriage is given to humanity as both opportunity and obligation. Marriage is not a human invention. It is the arena created by God in which the glory of God is to be exposed. Marriage. It is instituted by God himself. And in Genesis 3.21, when God created man and woman and put them together as a unit, as a married couple, he said, it is very good. Rick Ezel writes and he says, adultery starts in the head, before the bed. First, Satan gets our attention, and then he engages our feelings, resulting in action. Once something has our attention, then it's easier to get our feelings. We all know that to be true. And once our feelings are engaged, then it's easier for our actions to follow. He goes on, whenever I have shopped for a new car, the salesperson encouraged me to go ahead and take it for a test drive. He wanted to engage my emotions and my feelings with the smell of a new car and the feel of the drive. And once something or someone has my feelings, then it's easier for my actions to follow. And this is what happened to David when he seduced Bathsheba. He was out for a walk. He looked and saw her. And then he looked again. The woman got David's attention. And then the desire was created. And once his feelings were engaged, he was easy prey for temptation. And we know the rest of the story. This here commandment, you shall not commit adultery, verse 14, deals with our sexuality, obviously. Uh, each person here is just one person with three parts, but we are just one person. There are not two people residing in you. First, you have your body, which is your anatomy, determined by your DNA and expressed through your five senses. Then you have your soul. Your soul is your personality. Your soul is your ability to think, to reason. Your soul is the expression of your desires and your propensities. Your soul is your self-awareness. And then you have your spirit, also that immaterial part of you, but so intricately intertwined with your soul. Your spirit is that part of you that is made alive when you know Christ. And when he makes you alive, then you can know him more and more, and you can worship him. Body, soul, and spirit. Adultery involves the entire person, body, soul, and spirit. 
It is a violation of the marriage covenant. But it's more than just a physical act. It involves your soul and spirit as well. But it also involves the body, soul, and spirit of the one you're married to. Your marriage will suffer a violent rupture when there is adultery. Not a disillusion, but a rupture. Adultery is any sexual activity outside of your marriage, including lust, including fantasies, including online relationships, which will never get physical. It's adultery. We, we live in a society today that says, like many other sins, that adultery is excusable. In fact, it's become very commonplace to excuse adultery. Anthony Burgess described it as the most creative of sins, meaning that men in particular go out of their way. They're very creative in order to commit this sin. Esther Perel writes in her book, In Defense of Adulterers, she argues for a more compassionate understanding of our unruly desires. Notice here that this commandment leaves no room to excuse with any degree of compassion the sin of adultery. Forgivable, yes, but not excusable. Some people look at this commandment and say, well, you see how prude the Bible is? You see how out of touch the Bible is with our modern world? Jonathan Grant, in his book, Divine Sex, asks the question, what is it about our cultural moment that makes the Christian vision of sexuality seem naive and unrealistic at best and downright repressive at worst? Well, let me try to answer Grant's question. Could it be that we have a wrong understanding of self and that's why we can't understand when the Bible says do not commit adultery? C could it be that we are not understanding who we are supposed to be and what we are supposed to do? I think so. Uh, could it be that we have a wrong understanding of what the role of sex is and the need and what it is about? able to accomplish and not able to accomplish? Could it be that we have placed self-pleasure over everything else as our highest value and our premium goal in life? Self-pleasure. Could it be that we have lost any sense of loyalty? That we have lost any sense of covenant love? That we have lost any sense of selflessness and self-control? in exchange for self-expression and self-love? Could it be that our culture is so overly sti stimulated sexually that it is inevitable that the natural man will, will seek after adultery? Adultery is wrong. And it's wrong because it conveys indifference to your spouse. But worse than that, it's wrong because it violates your word of confidence and promise of loyalty. But worse than that, it's wrong because it severs the relationship and it breeds distrust. But worse than that, it's wrong because it shares marriage intimacy with another. But it's wrong, even more so, because it ignores the covenant that was made before God. And my friends, God will hold you to that covenant. What's the solution to adultery? The solution to adultery is an ongoing, deepening love for the person you're married to. Oh, but you don't know who I'm married to. Well, the solution to adultery is a deepening love for the person you're married to. 
But how can you deepen your love for the person you're married to? By deepening your love for the one who saved your soul, Christ himself. You see, the more you deepen your love for Christ, the more you will be able to love the people around you, including the person you married. And maybe many years ago you fell in love, but some years ago you fell out of love. Deepen your love for Christ, and you will deepen your love for the person you're married to. In my opinion, it is virtually impossible to be loyal to your spouse in this lewd world filled with promiscuity. It is virtually impossible to be true to your spouse if you are not being anchored to the principles of God's word. You need to be anchored to Christ, to the truth of Christ, if you want your marriage to work. It begins there. These are three more rules for life. Rules that bring life. Anyone who wants to be liberated needs to keep these in mind. Liberated from the contention that can very well exist at home. Liberated from hate and revenge that brings to murder. Liberated from lust and adultery. They are designed for the community at large, but also and specifically for you, the individual. And as you can see, these rules not only liberate us, but they show to us how dependent we are on Christ himself. How much we need Christ. Because left to ourselves, we'll break these commandments over and over again. Our Lord and Savior, we are grateful because we can count on you to give us wisdom and self-control, to give us a desire to see these liberating truths work in us. We thank you, Lord, that you've brought us to this point. We pray, Lord, that you'll keep carrying us so that we will live lives that are sanctified before you, Lives that will not only delight us, but delight those who encircle us. And may you be glorified. Amen. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 we cry holy, 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 you are holy, holy, to see you. Holy, holy, holy. Sing it out. Sing it out. 
Christianity is just simply a set of rules for you that bind you and stifle you. I want to invite you to investigate the claims of Christ and to place your faith in Christ, give your life to Christ, and know what it means to be born again. If you have questions in regards to this new birth, please speak to me, and I'll show you what it means, how to give your life to Christ according to the scriptures. Pray with me. Our, our Lord and Savior, we ask that you would bless us as we leave this place. May you be glorified. May your name be extolled, not only now, but throughout this day, throughout this week. May we know the joys of serving you and the liberating power of our Savior. Amen.